Welcome back to Supreme Myths. My guest today is David Latt. David is a graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School. He clerked for the Ninth Circuit. He um, was a prosecutor. He worked for Wachtell Lipton. He started the very, very influential legal blog, Above the Law. He's written a novel, Supreme Ambitions. His newest project is Original Jurisdiction, which is a substack, which we'll talk about because I hadn't heard that word before. Um, and, and of course, um, David went through a, a horrible experience with COVID-19, which we will talk about as well. David, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Eric. I'm a longtime listener, and I'm glad to be here. Well, thanks. I've been a fan of yours for a long time, um, and it's great to meet you this way. Um, so let's start with Above the Law, which really has had an enormous influence on the legal community. How did you get the idea? How did you implement it? And why did you do it? So I, my first blog was actually a blog I did under a pseudonym called Underneath Their Robes. And this was something I wrote while I was still a federal prosecutor and assistant U.S. attorney. And it was a humor and gossip blog about judges. And to make a long story short, I found that I enjoyed the blogging about law more than I enjoyed the practice of it. And so around 2006, I was looking for a way to turn that hobby into a living. And that's when I came up with the idea for Above the Law. And I pitched it to a group of investors who uh, have a company called Breaking Media, which publishes different websites. And they liked the idea. And so I connected with them and, and launched Above the Law for them. I have a small stake in Breaking Media, the, the parent company of Above the Law. But my inspiration in many ways was sort of those early 2000s blogs, much like, right. for example, the Dearly Departed Gawker or <laughs> uh, Wong Cat, which was a politics blog that I worked for. In the early days of blogging, where blogs were offering a kind of candor and authenticity and humor that you couldn't find in more mainstream publications, and there were those blogs for other areas, whether it was politics or media or entertainment. And I wanted to bring that sensibility to the legal profession. So that's really where I came up with the idea. And for the first two years, it was really just me uh, hammering away at the keyboard. But eventually it developed a following. David, do you have any sense um, today how many people, you know, I know, I know you're no longer affiliated and we'll get with that, but, but how many people today approximately click on that, you know, in a day or a week or a month or whatever? Yeah, so right now the site gets around 1.3 to 1.5 million unique visitors a month. It will vary depending on what's going on in the news and during high news times where if some post goes viral, that number could be higher. In slower periods or shorter months, the number could be lower, but it's pretty much consistently over a million of that's, unique visitors per month. That's really amazing. How does it feel to have created something with that kind of far-ranging appeal? I had really no idea that it was going to turn into that. I was just looking for a way, like I said, to write and make a modest living of it. And I had no idea I would write something that would end up being read by millions. But, you know, it's funny. It has its... It has, it has its good things, that are, and it also has its downsides in the sense that it's like that Spider-Man quote, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Sometimes you feel a little nervous and you think, gosh, I'm going to write this thing and it's going to be read by so many people and I hope I don't say anything incorrect or unfair. And so even though the site could be irreverent and uh, sometimes snarky, I always tried personally to be really as fair to people as possible, especially given the large readership of the site. And uh, in, I think it was 2016, a person who goes by the name of Law Prof Blogs, most people watching this or listening to this will know that name, um, he, uh, it is a law professor at, um, who's anonymous. Um, and anyway, uh, uh, we wrote a little ditty about Judge Posner. I have to mention Judge Posner once a, once a podcast. It's my rule. Um, and uh, we wrote a little ditty called Pixie for President. Pixie's, of course, Judge Posner's cat, and you guys published it, and I actually, and, and which I appreciated, um, and, and actually, and, and he's anonymous. I'm sorry, that person's anonymous, and and me uh, wrote it, and um, I was amazed how many people read it. I mean, you know, the exposure <laughs> on the blog was great, and to this day, I'm not sure Pixie wasn't the best candidate in that particular election. <laughs> for, well, Pixie he was certainly better than some recent presidents of ours. Yes, I, so. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I remember that piece. It was really hilarious. And 
Judge Posner, who I know you admire and have written about quite a lot, as, as do I, uh, he was really sort of an early patron of my blogging career because he was somebody I corresponded with back in my underneath the robes days. So uh, I, I, I think very, very highly of him. So I will tell you that, uh, you know, and people know this, um, um, Dick and I have hundreds of hours of taped conversations, which may someday come out or may not. Uh, he certainly has no, he always thought they would come out someday. But he talked about um, that blog of yours all the time. He loved the fact that it was anonymous. And did he have some role in you not, in you, in, how, how did you end up that, how did it end up coming out that you were the person behind that? Ah, uh, yes, he kind of did in a way. That's what I thought. So yeah. I was pretending to be a woman for purposes of this blog, mainly right. to disguise my identity. Right. And I called myself Article 3 Groupie, Article 3, of course, being the provision of the Constitution that establishes the judiciary, and <laughs> Groupie being like a fangirl. And I was pretending to be this judge-obsessed woman who was also into fashion and style and jurisprudence. And Judge Posner suspected that I was actually not a woman. Right. And he actually said so in an interview with the ABA Journal, and he was correct about that. And some months later, he was proven right when I gave an interview to Jeffrey Tubin of The New Yorker, uh, revealing myself as the author of right. the blog. So he was onto something. And I think the reasoning he gave was, no professional woman I know talks like this, because <laughs> the style was very over the top, very campy. I think Chris Geidner put it well. He said it was like the drag queen of the legal blogosphere. I was just very, very exaggerated and right. um, and a bit ridiculous, but but fun, I think. He, he loved, uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> people don't understand his irreverent side. He 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 absolutely loved it. One more thing about that. Um, you also wrote a novel um, called Supreme Ambitions about a female law clerk, um, and I, I said it's a very good read and a very good book. He he blogged it. I mean he. Uh, Posner uh, plugged it on the back, but what I want to say about it is, and, and, my, and I read when I was reading it, I read passages out loud to my wife. We both agreed. Um, you really wrote. I believed you 100 percent that you were the main character was a woman. I mean, I, I think you did that extremely well. Um, so I think your skills got honed on that <laughs> over the years. Well, I also had the advantage of a number of women readers who gave me comments on early drafts, which right. I think helped. And that was easier in a sense because when I was doing the a blog, since it was anonymous, I didn't really tell anyone. Whereas when I was writing the book, it was known. And so I was able to reach out to people, including a friend of mine who's a woman who clerked at the Supreme Court and say, hey, what do you think of this? Right. Uh, I still get quit uh, quibbles from people who think I got details wrong. Like my cousin was saying, oh, you know, Judge Stinson wouldn't have worn that perfume. But <laughs> for the most part, I think I did okay. <laughs> uh, no, I, thought I thought you did very well in that. As someone who does some fiction writing. I thought it was really good. So, um, all oh, right. Thank so you. we are, this is, this blog, I mean, this this podcast is, of course, about law mostly. Um, but we're going to go away from that for a minute. Um, because uh, as everyone listening and watching this probably knows, um, you came down with COVID-19 very early on. Um, and I want to talk about that for a lot of reasons. But one of which is, and I want just to say this off the bat, um, you, um, my wife and I followed you when you were writing about your situation. And um, it was just, I don't have the vocabulary to describe how inspiring it was, how scary it was, how terrifying it was, and how it brought into our lives, our literally our bedroom, um, COVID and, 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 and what it was like and what it was going to be like and all that. And you really performed an amazing public service. So let's, let's pack up now. When did you first get symptoms and, and, and how fast did it hit you? And did you know what was happening to you? <laughs> yeah, so I got sick around the weekend of March 7 or 8. And it was early in the pandemic, as you were saying. New York was not yet locked down. And I didn't think it was COVID. There were, I think, 50 or so estimated cases in a city of 8 million. And so I thought, what are the odds that I'm one of a couple of dozen a few dozen people. Of course, we now know there were far more than that. But at the time, that's what I was thinking. And so I got sick around March 7 or 8 of 2020. And for the first few days, it felt very much like a flu. I had fever, I had chills, I had aches, I was tired. But then on around Thursday or Friday of that week, I started to have trouble breathing. And Ugh. that's when I began to get nervous. I called my primary care doctor and I spoke over the phone to 
a physician's assistant. And she thought, oh, you probably have bronchitis that maybe turned into the flu. She gave me some antibiotics and she gave me some cough syrup and told me I would feel better. But by the weekend, I didn't feel better. And on Sunday, which I think was May, uh, March 15, I went to my local emergency room and tried to, you know, and told them I, I was having trouble breathing. At the time, it was very hard to get a COVID test in the early days, as you might recall. So they wouldn't test me, but they told me, go home, uh, treat your symptoms at home. Um, and so I did. David, but then hold on. When you said day, you had trouble breathing, you, you used to be a marathon. I uh, used to run a lot, I know. What do you uh, describe that? Because I'm not even sure I know what that even, I hope I never get to know. Yeah. Like, what, so in terms of my underlying conditions, the only one I really had was exercise-induced asthma, meaning that if I exercise too vigorously, sometimes I start to wheeze or have difficulty breathing. And it's hard to explain. It's like you're not getting enough oxygen in your lungs. You're sort of gasping. It's, it's I don't know if it's like being suffocated or something, but you just, it's like you're breathing and yet you, you aren't getting what you're supposed to be getting right. out of the breathing right. process. Um, but I had the asthma under control. I would just take an inhaler before I exercised and I would be fine. And as you mentioned, I was a long time ago and very slowly I was able to complete the New York Marathon twice. And so it really didn't, it really didn't limit me in any way. And in fact, it had gone away that I didn't even really use the inhaler all the time and I was mm. still fine. And um, I, and I, it had been years since my last asthma attack, but I now think, or my doctors think that maybe my asthma was some condition that exacerbated my, my case of, of COVID. Right. And when I was having trouble breathing during that first week, it felt like having an asthma attack, which was something I hadn't had in years. And hmm. I took my little inhaler, my steroid inhaler to open up my lungs and it wasn't really working. It wasn't doing anything. And that's when I went to the hospital because I thought, gosh, usually the inhaler gives me some relief and it wasn't working. That must have been terrifying. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. Um, but it was weird. I was still resisting it. I was still resisting going because I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just muddle through at home. But at, at one point, my husband, Zach, said, look, if you don't go, I'm going to call 911 and you can go out on an ambulance and make a big to do or <laughs> you could just go. So that's what spouses I went, for. Right there. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, you know, it might have saved my life. I mean, there have been all kinds of how many people who have, have died of, of COVID at home without even going to the hospital. So on Monday, after having been turned away once, I went back and I said, I really can't breathe now. And at that point, I was in such bad shape. I, I couldn't even stand. I remember propping myself up on the counter at the intake Ugh. table at the hospital because I just I was so weak. And pretty much as soon as they got me into the emergency room, they gave me supplemental oxygen. I don't know what my levels were, but it was definitely below normal. And they put me in an isolation room away because the emergency room is this big space, at least at NYU. Right. And so they put me in what's called a negative pressure room where the pressure in the room is different from the pressure outside. So the contaminated air is not going from my room to the rest of the sure. hospital because as we know, COVID is extremely contagious, which is why, of course, I didn't have any visitors when I was in the hospital. Zach didn't go with me, obviously. And my parents didn't visit, our son didn't visit. Uh, so that was another thing. It was just a very isolating experience. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't imagine. So, so you, so you, so you get checked into the hospital, um, and, um, and and then at some point you get put on a ventilator, right? Yeah, that was about five or six days into my stay. For the first few days, I was stable, and they were giving me different treatments. Uh, they were giving me what they thought at the time was the best course of treatment. Of course, now we know some of these things don't work, like. I was given an antiviral called Kaletra, which clinical tests have shown doesn't really work. I was given the infamous hydroxychloroquine, which back then was being touted as this amazing thing. Right. Um, but I don't blame them because that was what was understood at the time to work. Right. But at a certain point, uh, Friday into Saturday, I was admitted on a Monday, I my oxygen levels dipped and even the supplemental oxygen wasn't enough. And so I was connected to a ventilator, which is this machine that breathes for you and I was, I was essentially in a medically induced coma for uh, six days or so. Do you remember that? I remember right before being, I remember being put on, or I remember when I was being prepared to be put on the ventilator where they're giving you drugs intravenously. Uh, I had to be moved to a different room. Uh, you know, they, they, 
they insert a catheter because obviously your bodily functions yeah. are not going to work when you're you know on right. this machine um i remember being asked questions which didn't sound so promising like are you willing to be an organ donor and oh, what methods do you wish to be used if you need to be resuscitated and i was 44 at the time with a two three-year-old son and uh, i i said everything some people say look i, I don't want extreme measures i said whatever you can do because I think I realized in that moment, I, I really wanted to live. I think sometimes people say, oh, you know, I've had this long life, right? I don't want, or if you're in great pain, maybe you don't right. want your suffering to be prolonged. But I just wanted to make it through. I wanted to make it to the other side. So um, the ventilator, uh, and of course, during this whole, until you got, until you were basically in a coma, uh, a medically induced coma, you were writing about all this. And, and you were writing about it, um, well, you're, you're a beautiful writer, obviously, but you were writing about it in such a powerful way. What gave you the energy to do that? So I kind of backed into it, honestly. I originally started talking about my COVID experience on social media because I just wanted to notify my close contacts that if they had interacted with me, maybe they should get tested or right. if they have symptoms, they might have COVID. And the easiest way I thought to do that was to go on Facebook and to go on Twitter. And I got such an outpouring of support. I wasn't sure, uh, you know, in my in our apartment building, once this came out, my husband was sort of treated as this pariah. Like, I wasn't really sure whether there was going to be some kind of stigma, but I just went for it. I just right. said, you know what, I'm going to write about this. and. I got such an outpouring of support and good wishes from the legal community, from the Filipino American community, from the LGBT community, from all different communities that I just thought, you know what, I'm going to keep doing this. And it was very much of a piece with my work at Above the Law and Underneath Their Robes in terms of taking something opaque or poorly understood, whether it's the judiciary and the Supreme Court or the world of large law firms, aka big law, or this novel coronavirus, this new disease we didn't know much about. And I want to just give people a sense of how serious it could be, because at the time there was a lot of debate about how serious it should be taken. And some people were saying, oh, it's just like the flu. And, you know, certainly for some people it is like my husband, he got COVID, but for him it was like the flu. But I wanted to convey that you could be a young and relatively healthy person and have this hit you very, very hard. And you may not know in advance whether you're one of those people who's going to be hit by it very hard. I remember having dinner with some friends in late February and talking about this. And I remember saying something like, oh, that doesn't sound so bad. It sounds like the flu. I'd rather just get it and get it over with and right. move on with my life. And I had no idea that I was going to be in the hospital for three weeks, that I was going to be on a ventilator for almost a week. I had no idea. And I just wanted to convey to people the gravity of it. Um, so last year, um, my wife's mother had a brain aneurysm. Um, she's fine now. And she was in the ICU for six days. She was not in a coma, though. I mean, she, in other words, she was aware, drugged up, of what was happening to her. And um, living through, not, I, we couldn't visit her because it was during COVID, which was very hard for my wife, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, we did talk to her on the phone occasionally, and, and, and we were generally aware of the situation. And then talking to her afterwards, David, it sounds like not being aware of where you are is absolutely the best place to be if you have to be in an ICU. They were waking her up every hour with bells and, and loud noises and lights. And, you know, that may be the, a brain aneurysm thing more than an ICU thing. But that experience is not something I would wish. I mean, it, 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 it you know, I, I think it's very serious. Um, in that sense, maybe it was a good thing that you were in a medically induced coma. Yeah. I was glad I was out of it because yeah. people who have been on the ventilator sometimes have a post ICU yes. syndrome, which sounds yeah. in some ways like a form of PTSD yes. where they have hallucinations, they have flashbacks. I have really no memory of that time. And I was able to sleep, I guess, because when I wasn't on the ventilator during just normal ICU times, I think it was very much like your mother-in-law's experience, I was constantly being woken up. They had to check my vitals. They had to change the IV. They had to do something with the IV. They had right. to do this. They had to do that. Right. So you're being woken up every couple of hours. They had to give me a, an anticoagulant so I wouldn't get blood clots. Uh, you're constantly being poked and prodded. So um, I was glad to be <laughs> yeah. in this slumber for, for six days. Yeah. But it was just weird because 
it was like those six days never happened. Anything that happened during those six days, I thought, wow, that, that happened? Like, I think Terrence McNally, the playwright, died during that time. And I remember reading about it weeks later, and I thought, wow, that, that happened? When did that happen? And it right. happened when I was on the ventilator. So it was like it hadn't happened. Do you have any long COVID symptoms? I did for a while. Uh, probably it took about a year, I would say, to, to really get over them. I had a shortness of breath. I had a terrible cough. And this is for weeks or months after I left the hospital. I had lost my voice because the ventilator, the tube they put down your throat yes. damages your vocal cords. Yes. So I couldn't talk normally for three months. Um, I was really fatigued and had shortness of breath for probably a year. Now, thankfully, I feel fairly recovered, especially I feel very grateful because so many people with what's called long COVID have symptoms, you know, going well into, you know, a year and a half, however long we've been in this. Right. For me, the only thing is that my sort of dormant exercise induced asthma is now back. So I really have to be good about taking my inhaler before I exercise. I mentioned earlier that I had reached a point where I didn't really need to take it that much. Now, if I'm doing anything vaguely aerobic, I need to take a puff or two on that inhaler. Otherwise, right. I'm going to start to wheeze. So thank you for being so honest about this and, 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 and forthcoming. And let me ask you one more question, and then we'll get back to the law, which is what we're supposed to be doing here. But this has been just, um, you know, as I said, I really mean it. You, you were an inspiration to a lot, you, a lot of people. Um, so uh, I was once on a highway in the rain, did a 180, saw a big truck coming at me, and I thought, all right, my time is over. This, this is it. It wasn't, obviously. Um, but that lasted about two seconds, you know, and then and then I was hit, but I knew I, I wasn't dead. Um, that's the closest I've come to experiencing I might die in the next five seconds. Um, being so close to death, which you were, did it, and this may be too vague or bad a question, but did, did it change your perspective on living at all? Yeah, definitely it did. I think one thing was, and again, this is all very cliched, but certainly deeply felt, it really just gave me an appreciation for just the value of life. I just, right. like I said, like I, sometimes people say, oh, you know what, I've had a full life, I've had an exciting life, if my, this is my time, it's my time. But I thought to myself, this is not my time. <laughs> um, I, uh, I started praying, I'm, I'm Catholic, I started praying the Hail Mary over and over again as they were getting ready to intubate me. I just... Right. I just, I think we just kind of take life for granted in many ways, and it just really hit home that it it could end. I had this weird fleeting thought of excitement of, wow, I'm finally going to find out whether there is or is not an afterlife, like this question <laughs> that all these philosophers and scientists right. and theologians have debated. So that was like, that was like the silver lining. I was like, I'm about to be led into the club and like find out, of course, maybe there's, maybe I wouldn't exist anymore, but right. I just kind of had this, but that was the only positive thought. Everything else was right. negative. I want to live. Um, I want to survive. And I think the other takeaway I had was I just was so grateful for just friendship and support because I got so much support. I got, I got, I got get well tweets from Cher and really? everyone on the ideological spectrum from Ted Cruz to Susan Rice. I mean, it was wow. really, it really was really uh, touching and, and affirming. And I just, I'm so grateful for, for all of that. And you know, I'll, I'll confess, you know, a year and a half later, what have you, you, you know, there is a reversion to the mean. There are times where I'm just stressed about whatever, you know, annoying problem <laughs> we have and we move to a new house. It's like, oh, the air conditioner, you know, like you do revert to the mean. But I try as much as I can to just think back and and remember and, and get a sense of perspective from this this near death experience. My incredibly non-medical um uh, amateur uh, thought about this is that your strong desire to live might have been what saved you. I, I think it could. I think so. Absolutely. I mean, I really and I, I think probably it helped that I was in relatively good health going into this and it helped that I had all of this support. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm just I'm so grateful to the doctors and nurses at NYU who were amazing. Um, I was given an experimental drug while I was on the ventilator, which could have helped. Right. I think the studies on it are still ongoing. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm just I'm just profoundly grateful to still be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for I all mean, of that. I mean, you know, it's, it's I mean, I don't I don't even know what the count is now. Like 700. Like how many thousands of Americans and how many people yeah. worldwide have died, including many unnecessarily. Yeah. Whether it was because of the 
botched response in the early days of the pandemic or whether it's because of people refusing to get vaccinated or what have you. Um, but it's just, it's, it's I, again, I just feel so lucky to be here considering how many people are not. Well, we're, we're lucky to, you're still here. Um, all right, so let's move away from that, but that was wonderful, thank you. Um, after, sometime after all this happened, you decided to leave um, Above the Law and start a new project. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I I actually had left Above the Law a little bit before. I okay. had taken this okay. sort of detour into legal recruiting. In 2019, I left Above the Law and joined Lateral Link, which was actually an early advertiser of Above the Law. It's a nationwide legal recruiting firm. And I thought it would be sort of interesting to try my hand at something new, having been doing Above the Law for, I guess by then it was something like 13 years. And I enjoyed the recruiting, helping lawyers helping law firms find talent, helping lawyers find positions. But one thing I realized, I think, during the pandemic was writing was really my my real passion. Um, the recruiting was certainly lucrative, but I just didn't love it as much. And again, one of these realizations that you have during the pandemic is just life is short and you really should do what well, you, you love. Right. <laughs> of course, not a lot of people are talking about people who have left their jobs during this. They call it the great resignation, people who are leaving their jobs to pursue something that they find more meaningful. And so for me, um, I I left Lateral Link and returned to full-time writing, and I now have a Substack newsletter or website called Original Jurisdiction, where I write about law and legal affairs. It's on the Substack platform, which is a little bit different. It is uh, it's funded not by ads. I don't have any ads, unlike Above the Law. It's funded by reader subscriptions, and people pay a few dollars a month or $50 a year, and they get access to what I write. And that is, that's essentially the economic model of it. And $5 a month, that may not sound like a lot, but if you have enough people, you can make a living of it. And sure. so I'm not quite at the point where I think it's a living, but... I've given myself a year from when I started sub paid subscriptions to get there, which means May of 2022. And so I'm hopeful that I can I can get there and and get this to be a viable. And is it just uh, you writing? viable measure. Sorry. Uh, so I looked at it last night a little bit, and it seemed, it's it's just you. You don't have a, you don't have other writers. It's just David yep. Latt on law, basically. Yeah, and you know, in some ways, that was very intentional. One thing about Above the Law was by the time I left, it had grown so much. Uh, so I was the first writer in the first two years, but then every two years we added a new writer, Ellie Mistal, Stacey Zaretsky, Joe Patrice, Catherine Rubino, and we added columnists like Law Prof Blog. We added dozens and dozens of columnists, and that was great in many ways because these columnists had different perspectives, different sectors, different subject matter uh, expertise. So for example, Law Prof Blog is a great example. Um, this person writes about legal academia from the inside, and that's a wonderful, valuable perspective that none of us could bring. But one of the downsides is, you know, you have so much content, and I was the managing editor, meaning I was nominally the head of it, but it was not a very top-down organization. It was a very flat organization. People get to write what they want, and right. that's one of the nice things about writing for Above the Law. You have a huge amount of editorial discretion. But it meant that all kinds of things were being published and sometimes things that I disagreed with or didn't like. And yet, if your name is at the top of the masthead, you get all the complaints and all the quibbles <laughs> yes. and all the disagreements. And I just kind of thought, you know what, I want to just have a venue where it's just me, kind of like in the early days of Above the Law or underneath their robes, where I'm the only one writing. And if I make a mistake, it's it's on me. I mean, I guess it's like being a law professor. I mean, I know sometimes you call author articles, but at least when it's your name on that law review article, you know, it's like that little dagger footnote, you know, all mistakes are your own. Like, yes. that's what I wanted. Like, yeah. maybe I'll make some mistakes or say some stupid or offensive things, but at least it will be on me and it won't be someone else. So uh, for now, I have no plans to add co-authors. I, I like having my own show. Right. Uh, Law Prof Blog, by the way, came on this podcast blacked out, um, you know, so no one could see their identity, and it was it was it was really fun. Um, all right, David, I I have followed your career, and and I think your takes on the law are interesting and provocative, and I'm and I'm sure we agree on some things and disagree on a lot of things, and that's how it should be, probably. Um, uh, so let's we don't have that much time left, but but let me ask you just kind of a lot of questions about Supreme Court reform because that's been in the news. You've given as much thought to these kinds of issues as pretty much, you know, anybody over the course of your life. Um, 
And, and you also come at it from a perspective of someone who really understands big law, which I don't think is irrelevant to some of the questions we face, given big law's monopoly almost on who gets to argue in front of the Supreme Court, on which cases they take, and, and all that stuff. So um, let's start with this. Um, the Biden Commission, to me, complete and total fraud, joke, farce. Now, not the people. I have a lot of friends on that commission. But the whole mission of it is just, to me, it made things much worse. Do you have a take on this? I guess it depends on what you saw of it as the mission. And maybe I'm too jaded or cynical, but to me, it seemed the mission was to kick the can down the road for yes. President Biden and yes. to allow him to appease people who were looking for structural reform or expansion of the court or court packing or whatever you want to call it, while uh, sort of, you know, appease them, but but not necessarily do that because I don't know that he actually really wants to do that. Right. And if that was its sort of political purpose, it, it kind of served the point, although maybe it didn't in the sense that it didn't really appease anybody. Um, I think people saw through that. But the other thing is, remember, the mandate of this commission, they were supposed to not really give recommendations. They were supposed to offer some kind of analysis, but no real normative recommendations, which I thought was a very strange mission because how can you convene this commission of these, you know, a couple dozen really brilliant people and have them do an analysis, but no recommendations? I mean, it's a very fine line. And so I thought it was strange. So I guess you could say it, it kept to its mission in the sense that it didn't really offer any recommendations. But at the end of the day, I think it's going to be fairly toothless. The one area where, I don't know, I think it could be interesting is the commission did talk a good amount, at least in the draft recommendation, or sorry, not rec draft no, materials. They're not recommending anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The draft materials yeah. about this idea of uh, you know, term limits for the justices. Yeah. And if that starts to get more, and you know, in our little world, it's been talked about all the time, but yeah. if that starts to get broader traction, maybe that'll be one positive thing that comes out of this, because I do think it's a good idea. And it's one of the ideas that has support on the left and the right. I think some of the other ideas are going to be tough to implement. Uh, the other idea is being floated for reform, right. just because somebody's ox is being cored on one side or the other, whereas I think with the term limits, that's not really a political thing. Everybody benefits, I think. You know, it's interesting because in, so I wrote a book in 2012 called Supreme Myths, Why the Supreme Court is Not a Court and its Justices are Not Judges. And, in my con and, and Posner actually made me, I wasn't going to give any proposals. I really wasn't. Um, I was going to be a descriptive account so that I, people would understand I had, I was just giving the script, but he got mad at me and insisted I write a chapter of proposals and my publisher wanted to that also. So anyway, um, I went around the country talking about term limits. And you just said, you know, now it's left and right. Back then, it absolutely was not. Um, the, there, there were some sympath sympathetic people on the left, not many. Nobody, almost no, I mean, Calabresi was and a couple others, but very, very few people on the right, they thought I was a Looney Tune. Uh, and now I think you're right. I think in the only, what, eight, not, I'm not, this is not a cause and effect thing. Something in the world changed between 2012 and today that now term limit, almost no one says, oh, that'd be a terrible idea. Almost nobody says that anymore. What do you think changed? What do you think changed? I think partly people just, so since 2012, we've had a number of Supreme Court and lower court confirmation battles, and they've just been so ugly and so heated. Yeah. And regardless of where you, and of course, you know, the really ugly business with Judge Garland, and then of course the, I mean, I and then, you know, the Kavanaugh, I mean, like there's just been so much ugliness on that score that I think everybody just wants a change, wants to just kind of get past that. And I think when you have life tenure, you increase the stakes for any given nomination so much that you get this kind of thing. Um, so one, uh, you know, and I haven't found a persuasive case against it. I think Judge Wilkinson wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. He so, did time ago and I didn't even I can't even tell you what his point was like I just <laughs> I don't think there is really a good case against it if you have a long enough term like 18 years which is one frequent proposal that totally gives people uh, judges independence and I'm sure that after you serve on the Supreme Court um, I don't know that you're going to be terribly worried about your post you know bench prospects right. I mean I'm sure there are many law firms that would love to have a former Supreme Court justice or maybe they're going to have that kind of pension that 
judges who take senior status have. Um, I, I, I don't, I think you'll have lots of judicial independence, and I don't think you're going to have people worried about the political implications of their decisions. I mean, 18 years versus a life term, I mean, I don't know that it's, I mean, I don't know that it makes a difference from, in, from an independence perspective. I think it does make a difference in terms of having regular turnover and having presidents getting you know, a set number of guaranteed appointments. Right. Uh, interesting. Two things about Judge Wilkinson. Um, I, I really admire him because, um, you know, yeah, I'm, me too. I, I'm in favor of strong judicial deference. He's as close as we get to that, I yes. think, on, on the bench. Lack on both of, sides. La the lack of clarity is not part of his. He wrote an article about Roe and Heller that, to, to me, is one of the top 10 law review articles ever written, where he said basically Roe and Heller are the same. I do agree with that. Um, but that op-ed he wrote in the Post is really unclear and fuzzy, which makes me think, you know, it's not, he's not an unclear guy. So it makes me think, but, no. but, but I, I talked to non-lawyers a lot in my last third of my career. I've been spending a lot, I've been doing it 30 years. I've been spending a lot of time talking to non-lawyers and smart, informed non-lawyers. And I say the following sentence and they're like, well, yeah, of course. The thing about life tenure is it's not complicated. How about this? Never, ever, give a government official with unreviewable power a job for life. How's that? <laughs> I mean, is it, is it that hard? I mean, is it really that no. hard? <laughs> you know, um, all right. Um, I have, you're, you're so in tune to a lot of the workings of the courts, you know, more, more than most, most people. I want to raise a, an issue that some people think is small. Um, I don't think it's small. I think it's big. And I've been yelling about this, trying to in various four for years. Silence. I can't get anybody to pay attention to me. I don't understand how any historian, political scientist, legal academic, or the public could possibly have the ability to appraise how our Supreme Court justices perform, which is something we should do as a society, right, because they're really important, without knowing their votes and whether to hear a case or not in, in certiorari. In other words, we have this system where we never know, unless somebody dissents, which is very rare, whether a judge justice voted to hear a case or not. It turns out that from Justice, I think, Blackman's papers or somebody's papers, we know that Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist, almost never voted to hear a civil rights case. Um, if it went for the, if it went against the government, he almost voted never to do that. And that's an historical fact of importance. This, this whole anonymous cert process seems to me insane. Do you think I'm insane? Because no one else kind of agrees with me about this. I guess I can kind of see the pros and cons. On the okay. one hand, I've been a big proponent of transparency, yes. and I think not knowing the votes is a very important thing. On the other hand, I guess the sort of traditional line is, well, certiorari is not a judgment on the merits, and everybody always complains when some newspaper says, oh, the Supreme Court upheld this or denied that, when really, oh, they just were not deciding to hear it and left the lower court decision in place. They didn't say thumbs up or thumbs down on the substantive issue. So, I, I guess I, you know, if you take this formalist view, I guess you could say, well, certiorari isn't important because you really should focus on what they actually do. But I, given their the discretionary nature of that docket, I do think it's hugely important as to what they do or don't do. Um, you know, it would be interesting um, to at least try it out with, say, the so-called shadow docket or these emergency applications. Right. What if they had to declare their votes for that at least? Because you know, as someone who's been watching the courts super long, like it's all baby steps for them. Yes. Like even this now live streaming of audio, it's like, okay, well, first let's try like, you know, in this real time audio, it's like, well, first let's try like making the audio like same day. And then, <laughs> you know, now they're doing real time. And, and now they've added this period of questioning where the justices go justice by justice in addition to the free for all questioning. like. It's all like little steps. And so if you were to dip a toe in that water, maybe you would say, let them disclose their votes on these emergency applications for relief, this, this so-called shadow docket. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, obviously they have the power to control their own rules and they would probably say that if Congress tried to step in, it would be a separation of powers issue. Like, I don't know that you're gonna get too much change anytime soon. Um, three thoughts about that. Uh, Akhil Lamar, who I once talked to about this, had an idea that I, I think is really good to start, baby, you know, baby steps. For those cases that are granted, sir, when the case is over, not before, but when the case is over, then disclose who voted to grant 
cert because now the lawyers can't use it, you know, tactically or whatever. Um, and, and that's not enough for me, but I think it wouldn't be a terrible start. On the baby steps issue, um, Justice Roberts in the year of the Obamacare case, I think, wrote his year-end report about pneumatic tubes. And he basically, the Supreme Court used this pneumatic tube system yeah. of, of sending messages to each other way past the time that technology was. And he said what you just said. I mean, Justice Roberts said what you just said. We take baby steps. We go very slowly. He was proud of it. I don't think it's a source of pride, but that's what he he, he said. And then, and then lastly, um, on the shadow docket, um, I, I do think we're going to see some changes there. I, I think the court is a, not, not on necessarily this issue, but they are too acutely aware of how this is bothering people on the left and the right. That they're, that, you know, they, they do watch the election returns and they do read the newspapers um, and they do care. Do you agree with that? Do you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So in Justice Alito's rebuttal <laughs> that he gave at Notre Dame, yeah. he went through something like 20 points. Right. He, they all came from op-eds and testimony and right. law review articles. They all came from somewhere. And he or his clerks read all of that to come up with 20 rebuttal points or however many it was. Right. So for them to say, oh, we exist in this bubble and we don't know. I mean, no, 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 they, they, they are very much aware of what they are. They're very much aware of what's going on in the world outside. And they are, they are conscious of the reputation of the court. On that point, and I think I've said this before on this podcast, um, Justice Thomas seems to be very proud of his reputation that he does not care about any of those things. Uh, here, here, here are some interesting facts for you about Justice Thomas. He's from Georgia. You know that, of course. He's from Georgia. He is a regular visitor to Emory, University of Georgia, John Marshall, and Mercer. He's been to all of those schools at least once, and I think several of those schools three or four times. He likes coming back to the state of Georgia, which is his home. He has never come to Georgia State, despite an open-ended invitation from a former Justice Stevens clerk, who's a colleague of mine, who happens to be African-American, open-ended, come whenever you want. No, won't do it. Um, and I've been told by some very high-placed people um, who are friends with Justice Thomas that, because it's very mysterious, right? I mean, it's a public school and that, um, that I, this is going to sound egotistical. I don't mean it that way. But no one's been more critical of Justice Thomas in print than I've been. And I have been told that might be a factor in all of this. Now, I, when I first heard that, I said, he doesn't care about me. I'm not, you know, no one cares. I mean, I don't have that kind of pull. But I think actually that might be the case. Um, and, and that's sad. And, 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 and we even made it clear that he would have a warm welcome. You know, we between the lines, Siegel won't be around. Or that, that kind of, he still won't come. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. And we're his home state. I mean, it's really, you know, so I do think they care. And, and, and The justices are, so on this subject, yeah. for years, Justice Thomas would not go back to Yale Law School, right. his alma mater, right. partly because I think he remembered that some faculty had opposed his nomination to the Supreme Court. And I think he also, as he's spoken about publicly, felt that his Yale Law degree was was cheapened or something by- well, it's 15 the cents. That maybe, the quote is 15 yes, cents. exactly. Because said. of racial preferences that may have helped his application or, or something like that. And then another famous example was Justice Scalia not going to- Chicago. University of Chicago for a number of years because I think of something that maybe Jeff Stone had written or said about him. Yes. So it, it goes to show that even one person, yes. if that person really ticks off a justice, even one person like you could make a difference. Well, so, well, um, but, but wait, I, I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't rule it out. <laughs> well, but there's a big difference between Jeff Stone, who was on this podcast and told the story, writing in the New York Times that Justice Scalia's Catholicism might affect it, might affect his decision making. I agree, Scalia overreacted to that. But, but, and then Scalia didn't go back to Chicago for a long time. But Jeff Stone is a monumentally important historic law professor you know, at the University of Chicago in a way, and, and in the New York Times, in a way that I am not in any way, shape, or form. Now, the op-ed, I did write an op-ed in the LA Times about Justice Thomas, not about Justice Thomas, about Justice Kagan and the Affordable Care Act case, which said some negative things about Justice Thomas. He had agreed to come, and then he said no after that. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I do think that's part of it, but why he, I'm not being overly modest here, David, I'm not. I, I'm very proud of my career. But I'm not Jeffrey Stone. I'm not the University of Chicago. And it's just weird that one person could have that much effect 
on a Supreme Court justice's decision. And the whole thing is strange to me. All right, we, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I, I have one more question for you. Um, if you could change anything about our federal court system in general, Supreme Court, you know, Court of Appeals, and so on, if you could magic wand it, would it be life tenure or would it be something else? You know, um, I don't, I think that would definitely be up there. Yeah. Um, one other thing, and it does relate very much to the courts, is um, I think our Constitution should be somewhat easier to amend. Yes. I don't think it should be like California or something where you can make an amendment through some referendum process every couple years or something. I right. think that's a little haywire. But it's so, so difficult to amend our Constitution. And that really is, I think, a structural flaw, perhaps. And when people who advocate judicial restraint say, well, you know, if you don't like it, go amend the Constitution. Well, let's be real. That is so, so difficult. Um, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment never got um, uh, 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 confer, you know, whatever, right. uh, enacted, even though it had huge support. Like, it's such a tall order. And I think if we had a somewhat easier amendment process, maybe some of that pressure would be uh, taken off the judiciary and maybe it wouldn't ring so hollow when people say, go get a constitutional <laughs> amendment. That's basically like go jump in a lake. Like it's just, right. uh, so if I, again, I don't want California. I don't want it where you can amend at the drop of a hat, but there ha maybe lower that there has to be something. You and Thomas Jefferson believe that. Um, just, <laughs> just, just this morning on Twitter, where you have a huge presence, uh, and last night we were debating abortion and originalism and stuff. And, and I was making the point, what, country, what possible rationale could there be to decide a question as divisive and hard? I rep I, I'm pro-choice all the way, but I respect people who think it's murder. I don't believe that, but it, I, there are certainly were sillier positions out there in the world. It's a very divisive issue that, that all countries are wrestling with. The idea that we would eventually leave this to a group of lawyers to interpret an 1868 document when women couldn't vote and were the property of their husbands. Isn't that insane? Like, wh wh why would we look to how that, what that document meant in 1868, which is how originalists are phrasing this, um, to resolve this question, right? I mean, if, if, if this were a 1994 constitution, it would be a very different matter, right? Yeah, no, I saw your tweet on that, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think it is it is kind of strange to to think about it. I mean, I think that the response of the originalists would be, well, what alternative do we have? And do we want it to just be based on the intuitions of justices today? But I think one answer is we should have an easier amendment process, and then it will actually be based on we the people as opposed to either an antiquated document or opposed to the whims of justices or judges of 2021. Right. And, and, and of course, no one listening to this will be surprised by this. But of course, you know, my view of it is it is the whims of justices anyway. They just <laughs> they just pretend to use the meaning kind of thing as, as a way to get there. Anyway, David, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. Your story about COVID, I want to say it again. Not only is it inspiring now, but it was inspiring then. And it really brought to, I think, a lot of us the seriousness and the awfulness of this horrible pandemic. And um, no matter what happens for the rest of your life, um, that was a huge and valuable thing you did for people. And I, I personally want to thank you for it. It was, it was inspiring. Well, thank you, Eric. I'm, I'm glad uh, it was a positive thing. And uh, I, am really, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thanks for having me on. I hope our paths cross in person sometime soon. Um, take care. Thanks a lot.